So I'm going to ask you to help me as I get started a little bit here, because I'm totally moved by uh, my love for Anna. I've loved you for decades and decades and decades. You know that. And we've been friends for a long time, and Daria and the family. Um, I'm going to ask you to think for a second of the connection you have with Anna. You might know her for 67 years or maybe just this afternoon. But if there is a word that for you captures that about Anna that you will never forget, I want you just to think what that word is. Something about her nature, her character, her being, that you will hold that word and never forget it. And I'd like to hear from a few people. Just the word. Healer. Healer. Light. Light. Joy. 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 Liberator. Liberator. Grounded. Grounded. Spaciousness. Spaciousness. Authentic. Green. 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 That's a color. Green. Wild. Teacher, wild, love, love. funny, funny, yeah. elegant, elegant, inspiring, inspiring. These people, by the way, there's no order here. You see where I'm pointing my hand? Other people are speaking. That's the spirit of the deck here. Judy, mentor, truth, truth, honesty, earth. honesty, earth, courageous, courageous, riveting, riveting. sexy, sexy. Revolutionary. That's your second word, I think, and they're yeah. both great. <laughs> great. Vitality. Vitality. Charismatic. Charismatic. Relentless. Relentless. <laughs> Son-in-law. <laughs> Cheerleader. Cheerleader. Creativity. Creativity. Inviting. Enchanting. Giver. Chutzpah. Chutzpah. Childlike. Life dance. Life dance. Lover. Excellent. Sensual. Strong. Strong. Raven. Raven. Goddess. Goddess. Compassion. Compassioned. Persistent. Us. Us. Mother personified. Mother personified. So take a moment if you've not called out a word and turn to the person sitting next to you and just tell them what your word was and hear theirs. Please. And hold the word. All right, so I'm going to ask you all to make a promise. You guys promise that as long as you're breathing, you will always hold that word inside of you? When you think of Anna? Yeah. At least. Um, so I have never encountered another being as extraordinary as you in the ways that you are extraordinary. And um, what we just witnessed was over the top. <laughs> Deep, 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 deep. So when I was asked earlier this year if I would I'd just say a few words uh, as a tribute to Anna, I thought, well, who does she remind me of? And I came to conclude that she didn't remind me of anyone. <laughs> that, um, that this is a unique being. This is a unique being. And um, what I began to think about was a fable that I enjoyed in my life. And maybe some of you are familiar with the stone soup fable. Uh, and it's written in different cultures with different language and different characters. But the gist of the story is, and this one I was looking at just this morning, a boy comes into a village and he's starving. And he's trying to find a way to feed himself and to make magic happen. And so he uh, tells the people of the village that he's got a magical soup. And he picks up a stone when nobody's looking. And he says, it's a stone soup. And the word goes out throughout the land that there's magic about to happen. And the people say, well, where's this soup? And he says, well, I need a cauldron. If somebody has a cauldron, that would be most helpful. And so somebody brings a big cauldron, and he puts the stone in it. And everybody now is coming from the village, and they're looking into the cauldron, and they're wondering, uh, where's this magical soup? And, and, and somebody there with a chicken, and, and he says, well, you know, if you could put a little piece of that chicken in, I think it would kick things off. <laughs> and then there's someone else with big bags of water, and why don't you throw some of that water in, because that'll 
you know, make it come alive. And now more and more people are coming with parsley and carrots and potatoes. And he's saying to each one of them as he sees them, boy, if you could put a little bit of what you've got into this magical soup I've got, it would make it even a little bit better. And as the day and the sunset unfolds, lo and behold, there was a magical stew created. And um, so I've been thinking literally for a quarter of a year now, it's been one of my sort of thinking about your life, Anne Schumann, uh, born tomorrow in the year 2020. Excuse me, 1920. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I was sort of cultivated a little bit of the Esalen School, so being in the here and now is, I think, supposedly important. But I'm going to go back a little bit, because while Anna is with us here and now, uh, and I'm going to leave out a lot of things, so this is just going to be a ramble. Um, she was born into a very unusual moment in history. And as Jehan said, because of her uh, Jewish and Orthodox upbringing was exposed to that religion and that way of moving and feeling and chanting. But she came alive during the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties. <laughs> and so that era is in you. I thought, how amazing to not just read about the Roaring Twenties, but to have felt your body in the Twenties. You were a teenager in the Depression. You came up and saw the arrival of antibiotics and breakthroughs that took the life expectancy from about 50 or so when you were born to almost 79 on average by the end of the century. You saw the arrival of the Salk vaccine and saw a horrible disease put to the side. During the 1940s, you, as you became an entertainer and performer and you gained more knowledge, you became a bit of a renegade and were fusing comedy and serious issues. And you saw the Holocaust. You experienced this horrible thing happen in the world. It's in you. The atom bomb, you saw that happen. Television was not there when you were a young girl. Television appeared. You saw the civil rights movements. They were a part of you. A key part of you is about justice. I was thinking words when I was thinking for myself last night about you, Anna. Justice, freedom, fairness, liberation, consciousness. You saw the arrival of kind of a post-World War II psychological age. You saw the baby boom. You participated in it. <laughs> <laughs> you married a man who was in the Navy. You knew what the war was and the hope for it to end. And then when it ended, you saw the liberation movements. You danced to them. You felt them. You participated in protests. You've always been this renegade. Unfortunately, you probably saw a little bit of disco for a short while there as well. <laughs> Psychedelics came along. The women's movement came along. A greater appreciation for the inequities between racial groups or people with different sexual prefer preferences, and you're always battling. All the decades that I've known you, you've always been right there, blinging black and white together, no clothes, no boundaries, sexuality, contact, touch, feeling, life, fear, cancer, death. You saw the arrival of Israel. You've lived through the computer era. You remember when there weren't jet planes in the air. Technology. Recently, the Supreme Court voting to pay respect and give justice to people of different sexual preferences. All in a 95-year life that has been, without any question, the most complicated an extraordinary 95 years in the history of humanity. And every step of the way, rather than pulling away, you did your best to feel the issues, to make sense of what mattered, to be on the side of right. Without making a big lecture or running for an office, you fought for what you believe, always. So I think you're audacious. I think you're audacious. I know when people talk about the future, they always, you know, the Jetsons with high tech or, you know, Ray Kurzweil with his brain and a robot or something. But as I see the future, 
and I see more and more of us living long, long lives, and I know that women will be outliving men, and I know that women are ascending in power as they mature, that I think of you as the avatar from the future. Not only are you a woman who's lived a whole century, just about, but you exemplify, Anna, to me, all the things that I wish we could be so much more of. Last thing, and then I'm going to turn the corner and wind things up in a few moments. Uh, I could only handle myself a certain degree of suffering or pain or fear or righteousness or protest, but I've always been dazzled by how you just seem to take it on, you know, reclaiming Mount Tam, you know, running programs in parts of the world where people are being abused, uh, putting up dance movements so, so as to heal people who have been victims of human trafficking. Just your capacity, and of course Daria and the family, to step right in and to try to heal is unbelievable. So yours has been a long life, fully lived, fully felt. We are fortunate to bear witness to a being such as you. And the last thing I'd like to turn to uh, before I finish for this afternoon is um, we uh, had the good fortune of interviewing you and Anna at Esalen's 50th anniversary a couple of years ago, and you were sparkling then as you're sparkling now, and you're beautiful then as you're beautiful now. And uh, I asked you towards the end of our interview, do you feel like an old woman? And you said, yes, I do. And then you said, but not like the caricature old. Um, what I feel is the urgency. So many things I want to do so many things I want to experience, so many things I want to create in the time I have left. So I'd like to uh, ask for one other consideration for you folks to at least contemplate perhaps tomorrow or a year from now or on the drive home, is that um, I was, you know, Eric Erickson was also one of my mentors for a short while, and when he lived into his 90s, uh, the so-called expert on childhood became taken by the later years of life. And one of his great quotes was, I am what survives of me. I am what survives of me. I feel that it's partly our responsibility, our responsibility, to take what you have launched, what you have launched, and see to it that it continues for 35 more years, or 135 more years. That to simply allow the founders of a, a way of thinking and feeling and being to do the hard lifting, and then when they you know, pull to the sidelines, let it die, is a mistake. Not your mistake, would be our mistake. So I want to say to you that those of us who respect the Halperns and this place, and the art corps that is now in motion all over the world. And those of you who have noticed that in the last month there are 45 countries on this planet that have been celebrating this woman's birthday. <laughs> but all I'd like to say to you is that in the weeks and months to come, I'd like for you to contemplate reciprocity. Uh, I am not a fundraiser. Uh, I don't know how it works exactly, but people talk about giving and charity, and I just don't think about it that way. I think about it as reciprocity. If you have received anything from what they're doing here, and you're captivated by their programs in Argentina, and you're taken by what they're trying to do with people who've been victims of sex and human trafficking in the Philippines, and you're taken by the programs going on in the prisons of San Francisco, then in some way, if you can give something back to the Tamalpa Art Corps, they will have a chance to continue the story. And last, what I want to say is that 
about four o'clock this morning, I w I've been really struggling to try to figure out how to give a tribute to you. But what, but what I, what I was thinking this morning was that it's not as though you have danced in your life with different sections, movements. But this has been a 95-year dance. And happy birthday to you, our dear friend, Anna. <laughs>